You may be tiring of my uh, never-ending travelogue on the Holy Land, <clears throat> but I wanted to show you this morning this site, which uh, traditionally commemorates uh, the setting of the story we're going to hear from the Gospel, John chapter 21. This is called the Church of the Primacy of Peter, and it sits on the edge of the Sea of Galilee up at the northern edge, and it's built around a rock. And uh, the sign in front says Mensa Christi, which means Table of Christ. And in the gospel, we're going to hear how Jesus was on the shore preparing breakfast over a charcoal fire for the disciples and then, and then asked them to join him. This is the rock where they, tradition uh, says that took place. And this is looking out of the Sea of Galilee, which has receded greatly, but uh, just a beautiful, beautiful sight. And three of your favorite tourists who don't look at touristy at all, right? But as you step out of the church, <clears throat> down onto the shoreline, you'll find a series of stones shaped uh, like a heart. And this commemorates where Jesus asked Simon Peter, do you love me? So uh, I just want that to kind of be in your mind as we hear uh, this story from the final chapter of John's Gospel. After these things, after Jesus had appeared twice to his disciples... Uh, he showed himself again by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. <laughs> and they went out and got into the boat but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there. That's an important element, a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the, not, the net was not bro broken. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is... Now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because uh, he, was, he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fashion your own belt and and go wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, follow me, follow me, the gospel of the Lord. Would you join me in prayer, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. 
Married for more than 50 years, they played their own special game from the first time they'd met and fallen in love. The man and woman left notes, often tucked away or left in hidden places to surprise each other, and the message was always the same, S-H-M-I-L-Y. You might find these letters traced in the morning dew on the windows of their home or written in the steam left on the bathroom mirror after a hot shower where it would reappear bath after bath. A little notes with S-H-M-I-L-Y would pop up on dashboards and car seats or would be taped to the steering wheel. At one point, the woman unrolled an entire roll of toilet paper and wrote S-H-M-I-L-Y on the last sheet and then rolled it back up so that her husband would be surprised when he found it, which I'm sure he was. But day after day, year after year, the message never changed. See how much I love you. Laura Hammond, the woman who tells this story about her own grandparents, says this, Their relationship was based on devotion and passionate affection, which not everyone is lucky enough to experience. Grandma and Grandpa held hands every chance they could. They stole kisses as they bumped into each other in their tiny kitchen. They finished each other's sentences and shared the daily crossword puzzle and word jumble. My Grandma whispered to me about how cute my Grandpa was, how handsome an old man he'd grown to be. She claimed that she really knew how to pick him. Before every meal, they bowed their heads and gave thanks, marveling at their blessings. A wonderful family, good fortune, and each other. Her grandparents entered into a dark episode of their life together when her grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer. For more than 10 years, she battled the disease, and her grandfather was with her every step of the way. He painted their bedroom yellow so his wife could always be surrounded by sunshine even when she was too sick to go outside. And he remained by her side to the very end. His final tribute to his wife was at her funeral where on pink ribbons and a large floral arrangement he had scrawled in yellow the letters S-H-M-I-L-Y. Isn't that a wonderful story? You know, we've journeyed through Lent and Holy Week during which we remembered Christ's passion and suffering culminating in his death by crucifixion on Good Friday, and and now we find ourselves in the Easter season as we remember and celebrate the very good news of his resurrection from the dead. My brothers and sisters, if this Easter season means anything at all, if this cycle of death and resurrection really communicates anything important for you and me, it's simply this. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, Jesus says, see how much I love you. Just look at how much I love you. Not even a cross can stop God's love from reaching down to us and embracing us. Not even rejection or ridicule will hinder God from reaching out to us in love. Not even the coldness of a tomb could contain or constrict God's powerful love from bursting forth for you and for me. To you, to me, to everyone today, Jesus the risen Christ says, See how much I love you, today and forevermore. In John's gospel, following Jesus' resurrection, several of the disciples have returned to that which was most familiar to them, a life of fishing upon the Sea of Galilee. Nighttime was generally the best and most productive time to fish, but as the sun began to rise, they'd caught nothing, not a thing at all. A stranger appears on the shore and advises them to cast their nets on the right side of the boat, which they do. And to their amazement, they haul in an incredible number of fish. And then they suddenly realize that the stranger on the shore is none other than Jesus himself, Jesus who has been raised from the dead. Impetuous Peter, you got to love him, throws on some clothes and swims to the shore to meet him. After all, gospel says he's been fishing naked. Figure that one out. (laughs) And surprise of surprises, Jesus has already started breakfast over a charcoal fire, grilled fish and bread, yum, yum. When Jesus and the disciples have finished eating it, it appears that Jesus and Peter have some unfinished business to tend to. Jesus and Simon Peter walk along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. 
Jesus turns to him and asks, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than anything else? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. To which Jesus responds, feed my lambs. A second time, Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And once more, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, tend my sheep. Yet, A third time, Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? The gospel says that Peter was hurt at this point, likely exasperated by Jesus' repetitive questioning. And Peter says, Lord, you know everything. You know everything, and you know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. Jesus then speaks of Peter's future and how there'll be a day when he'll grow old, he'll not enjoy the freedom he now has, suggesting that he too will suffer a death that will glorify God. After which, Jesus simply says to him, follow me. Follow me. It may seem odd that Jesus asks the same question of Peter three times, but it really does make sense within the overall context of John's gospel. Just three chapters earlier, chapter 18, when asked if he knew Jesus, Peter denied even knowing him not once, not twice, but three times. You remember that? In chapter 18, after Jesus' arrest, Simon Peter finds himself in the courtyard of the high priest. He's asked a question by a woman guarding the gate. Aren't you one of this man's disciples? And what does Peter say? I am not. Now, interestingly enough, it just so happens there's a charcoal fire burning in the courtyard around which everyone is warming themselves. As Jesus is being interrogated by the religious authorities inside the house of the high priest, someone else asks, aren't you one of his disciples? And once more, Peter denies any association with Jesus, saying, I am not. And finally, a servant of the high priest clearly recognizes Peter and he says, didn't I see you in the garden with him when he was arrested? And yet a third time, Peter denies knowing Jesus at all. And so, in this final chapter of the gospel, once again near a charcoal fire, Jesus gives Peter three opportunities to say, I love you, for each of the times he'd said, I don't know him. Three times to say yes for each of those times he'd said no so emphatically. In fact, this passage is sometimes referred to as the rehabilitation of Peter. He is restored, if you will, to his place as a disciple of Jesus. My brothers and sisters, the good news of this story is that no matter how we might have denied Jesus, no matter whether we've stubbed our no- snubbed our noses or turned our backs to him, no matter if we betrayed him, even in the worst of ways, the risen Christ still comes looking for us as he did for Peter. And in so many words, he says, see how much I love you, full of love. And overflowing with grace, just as those nets were overflowing with fish, the risen Christ keeps showing up again and again, wanting to restore us, wanting to help us get our lives back on track, wanting to mend whatever relationship that may be broken and in need of a fresh start. To you, to me, to all of us today, Jesus, risen from the dead, says, See how much I love you. One biblical commentator says, Before Easter is a theological doctrine. It is an experienced reality. It is an experienced reality. You see, if it is anything, Easter is first a personal encounter with the risen Christ who continues to reach out to us in love and in grace. We're not done with the story, though. Because this same Jesus, this same risen Christ who so desperately wants to be in relationship with us, then invites you and me to respond to the same question he posed to Simon Peter. And he asks you and me, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? I like the story of the uh, preacher's wife who was in a Christian bookstore one day. She came across a bumper sticker that said, honk if you love Jesus. She thought it was clever. She purchased it, put it on the bumper of her car, And she quickly realized what a wonderful investment it was because she found people everywhere who loved Jesus. In fact, later that day, she was stopped at a red light 
And she was so lost in her thoughts, she didn't realize the, the light had turned green. And uh, she was thrilled, however, when the nice man behind her began honking wildly. And he even shouted, go, Jesus, go. <laughs> and I know I shouldn't make fun of preacher's wives because preachers aren't always the best drivers either. The truth is, my friends, that if we dare say yes to Jesus, if we dare to respond to his invitation of relationship, if we dare say that we love him, Jesus wants our answer to be reflected in our lives. Our own loving response to Jesus should be demonstrated by putting love into action. If we're going to say, yes, Lord, I love you, then we need to go about the business of feeding his sheep, tending his lambs, and caring for all those whom Jesus loves. 1 John 4, we find those words, Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. And Richard Rohr in his book, Silent Compassion, says this, Let's just live in a way that shouts Jesus. Live in a way such that no one can deny exudes the love and compassion of Jesus. Let's live in a way that just shouts the love of Christ. My brothers and sisters, the risen Christ stands before us today and declares, see how much I love you. No matter whether you've denied him, betrayed him, or ignored him, he still appears. He still surprises us with undeserved love and grace for you and me. Easter really is a personal encounter with this God of second chances, this God of new life and hope, this God of unending grace and mercy for you and for me. And what he asks of each of us today is simply this. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you once more for the message of this Easter season that you never give up on us, that you offer second chances and fresh starts even when we've denied you or betrayed you. We thank you, God, that your love cannot be stopped even by a cruel cross and that Jesus lives today. So give us hearts and give us eyes to recognize his loving presence all around us and give us grace to respond by putting love into action. In his wonderful name we pray.